Well, shalom, everybody. It is wonderful to be here this morning. You know, there was a, um, uh, a delegation of rabbis who had gone to the Vatican to um, begin a, a dialogue with, uh, with the, the Catholic Church. And so as the rabbis were in the Pope's office, um, the chief rabbi saw this really beautifully ornate phone that was on the Pope's desk. And the rabbi asked the Pope what it was, and he said, well, that's a direct line to God. And so the rabbi says, well, that's fabulous. He says, may I use it? And the Pope says, of course. And so the rabbi picks up the the phone, and he talks 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, hangs up the phone, turns to the Pope and says, thank you very much. He says, now, how much do I owe you for the call? And the Pope says, don't be ridiculous. You're our guest here. It would be absurd for us to try. And they go back and forth. And finally, the rabbi says, well, at least tell me how much the call was worth so I know how much to be thankful for. And the Pope said it was about 500,000 lira, or maybe about $1,000. A few months later, the Pope makes a return visit to Jerusalem. And in the chief rabbi's office, he sees a beautiful phone on the desk. And the Pope says, is that what I think it is? He says, yes, Pontiff, we have the same thing. And he says, well, may I use the phone? He says, absolutely, of course. So he picks up the phone. He's talking half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. He's got to do both Latin and, uh, and, and English. And, um, <coughs> and so after the call, he hangs up, and he, he says to the rabbi, he says, thank you very much. Now, how much do I owe you? He says, don't be ridiculous. He says, you're our guest. So, you know, we, we, we'd be absurd to do that. And they go back and forth, and finally he says, well, then at least tell me how much the call was worth so I know how much to be thankful for. And the rabbi looks at me and says, it was a shekel. Shekel is about 20 cents. He says, how on earth could it be so cheap? It's, uh, I talked for an hour, and the rabbi looked at him quizzically. He said, Pontiff, it was a local call. <laughs> a Light to the Nation's Messianic Ministries has a twofold mission. Number one, we help Jewish people understand that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Messiah promised according to the Hebrew Scriptures. We plant Messianic congregations to help break down the barriers of understanding for Jewish people and to get them to realize that it is the most Jewish thing in the world to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. The other part of our ministry is um, what we're doing here this morning, and we have the privilege of sharing the Hebraic roots of Christianity with the Christian church. Because if you look at where we are, you've got rabbinic Jew- or Judaism, which is over rabbinic Judaism over here. We've got Christianity over here with some things in it, which I would uh, uh, suggest may not necessarily be uh, what God wanted. But the truth lies in the middle, and that our desire is to bring Jews to faith through Messiah and bring Christians back to the Hebraic roots so that we really do create that one new man and unify both Jew and Gentile once again. And so we plant Messianic congregations, as I said. Uh, we have a, uh, it's more of a fellowship that we've been running in Vaughan for a little while now. And um, actually, Stephen uh, and I have been kind of talking about how we're going to formulate this because our Peterborough congregation, which we just launched uh, a couple months ago, is now switched to Saturday. So our Friday service, which contains a couple of unbelieving Jewish families, we're going to be moving to a Friday night Shabbat dinner. And the purpose of that is to be able to fellowship over food over, and break down the, these, uh, these barriers and to win them over through friendship and servant evangelism. And so we're going to do it over a meal and we're going to have a small devotion. And we're going to see what we can build through that. So there are many different ways of, of doing this. And what we discussed this morning, uh, wanted to discuss this morning, or when I was talking to Pastor Mark, and by the way, Mark and I have been trying to make this happen for several years now. Um, you know, we were waiting almost as long to get here as I think my people took to get through the desert. So, uh, we're delighted to be here this morning and, you know, (laughs) it was looking rather questionable with the weather and everything else. But one of the biggest struggles with the Christian church today, when you think about it, if we go back to Acts chapter 15, they they had the council on Jerusalem. And the biggest question was, Do the Gentiles need to become circumcised and convert to Judaism before they can become Christians? That was the issue that they were facing at the time. So in essence, the question that the church was asking back then was, what do we do with the Gentiles? The biggest question in Christianity today, I think by and large, is, what do we do with the Jews? It's been completely turned on its head. And as Mark, I think, fairly said, Jewish ministry is probably the most difficult ministry one can encounter. Listen, I've done street evangelism for Muslims. I have, the vast majority of people I've led to faith have been Catholics. 
I don't think there's any harder group for two reasons. Number one, because of the, the barriers to preaching the gospel, which we're going to discuss today, but also because of the spiritual warfare that comes with it. I did a, a bar mitzvah for an unbelieving Jewish family a couple of years ago, and uh, if you ever want to know how to get 100 Jewish people angry with you all at once, come to me and talk because I can give you some, a few pointers. And the, the family who was unbelieving had asked me to do this bar mitzvah, and I said to them, if I do this, I'm going to share my faith. And they said, no problem. And I said, are you sure? And they said, yeah, no problem. So okay. Well, we did it, and it turned out to be a big problem because the family cut me off after that. Um, nobody would speak to me, and uh, the, uh, the anger is still resonating within that family two and a half years later. So um, there are some very, very challenging issues when it comes to sharing our faith with Jewish people. And yet, if we take a proper approach, a lot of those barriers to sharing our faith can actually come down. And so my purpose this morning is, number one, to give you a better understanding of how to, uh, to, to reach God's chosen people. And I, I, I mean, I remember I, I had a chance uh, to talk with a pastor a couple of years ago about our ministry, and he looked at me in his office and he said, well, the Jews really aren't on our radar. And I sh kind of shook my head and I thought, well, they're on God's radar, so I don't know what you're doing. Um, now, it may not be your primary mission, but the bottom line is, is Psalm 122, verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. And so there is a, man and, and by the way, it's not a request. When it says pray, it means it's a command. And so we are commanded to pray because although the Jewish people, for the most part, have not received Yeshua as their Messiah for the past 2,000 years, it is still God's heart that they will. And if we read a little further on in that passage we were talking about in Romans 11:26, it says, one day all Israel will be saved. The problem is, though, if you read your, uh, your prophecy correctly, there's a holocaust that is coming, and we can see it beginning to formulate right now with all the anti-Semitism in the world, where Zechariah says that two-thirds of the Jewish people will be cut off in the coming persecution, which means that if there's 15 million Jews in the world today, that's 10 million who are going to perish. That's twice as many as Hitler got, because there will not be a North America for them to hide in. <clears throat> this time, the Holocaust is going to be a worldwide one. So what we want to do is we want to talk about how we can more effectively share our faith so that we may see some come to faith. But also, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss maybe some ways that are going to enrich your own faith in the process, because God, of course, does many things on many different levels. For 2,000 years, Jews have not responded to the gospel. And so the question that we have, and I'm very thankful we, the verse was chosen this morning, because that expresses Paul's heart. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they may be saved. And Paul went on further to say, for I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Jewish people are very zealous, well, some of them are anyway. I mean, I've got a lot of atheists in my family, and that, but when you look at the Orthodox community, they are very, very zealous for God, but it's not according to knowledge. You can be zealous and wrong. I don't know if you knew that or not. <laughs> Paul was very zealous and very wrong for a while there, and so that's why God had mercy on him. So the first reason why Jews don't believe is you've got the fall. And so what happened is, is that when Adam and Eve partook of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, immediately human nature came into rebellion against God. We see in Jeremiah chapter 17, 9, that it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And so human nature, left to its own devices, will end up in destruction. And the only reason that the human race has not consumed itself up until now is because of the grace and mercy of God and the restrainer that has been put on us. But we're going to see a time in the future where God takes that restrainer away and human nature is going to run headlong into what it always was. I personally believe, and this may be politically incorrect, but that's okay, um, I believe that Islam... Uh, which is a religion of violence and hatred, is God's judgment on the world because the world has been demanding a religion of violence for, for millennium. And so God is saying, okay, fine, if that's what you want, this is what you're going to get. And people don't realize the fruit of what they ask for. 
And so the very first reason why Jews don't believe in Jesus is the reason that all people reject Jesus, at least initially. And it's because of the human condition. We are not favorably predisposed to God, are we? None of you here this morning, I don't think, initially, uh, when you heard the gospel, was all that excited about it. And I remember that um, for me, I mean, I got saved, it was about 17 years ago, and I was on a three-year battle wrestling match. I mean, I was honest to my ancestors, you know, Jacob, we, we wrestled with God. Um, as a matter of fact, Israel means strived with God or, or wrestled with God and prevailed. And so we are all in opposition. None of us wants to seek out after God. It says that while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. It was God who came seeking after us. We, 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 we speak about the hounds of heaven and that they were relentless in their pursuit of us because none of us left our own devices would ever go seeking after God because, you know, the reality is, is that God tends to ruin a lot of our fun, doesn't he? He takes away those things that we think are enjoyable until we realize that they're not all that much fun. So there we have uh, the heart is deceitful. Again, we spoke about that. And... Um, the, the problem is, is that in the garden, Adam and Eve were in communion with God, but once we got kicked out, we lost those spiritual eyes. We don't see what's going on in the spiritual realm. And so many people judge what they see with their, their eyes and, and can sense with the five senses, totally being cut off from things. Whereas if we saw what was really going on, I think our attitude would change quite a bit. David tells us, that uh, in Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, that the Lord has looked down from heaven and upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. You are absolutely and utterly incapable of coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach, on your own devices. It has to be God through the drawing of his Holy Spirit. Remember, John 6.44 says, no one comes unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God has to do the drawing first. That was one of the first verses of scripture I ever memorized because I knew the ministry that God was calling me to and I knew that it wasn't up to me. You never notice how some people get really zealous when they first get saved and they think that the only reason other people aren't saved is because they haven't told them yet? This happens a lot in Jewish ministry, by the way. You know, the, the, the blinders come off and all of a sudden it's just like, wow, well, I got to go tell everybody. I wasn't all that thrilled about, how, you know, and I am an evangelist at heart, but you also have to know when that door opens because otherwise um, you're not going to get a very uh, good reception. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So, we're all incapable of finding God on our own. And so therefore, it is totally and absolutely up to the Holy Spirit to draw that person. And what we need to do as believers who are commanded to go share our faith is sense and check with the Spirit as to when that door may be opening. Okay, And so that might change our method of evangelism just a little. Now, you, you don't know where the Spirit is leading. Yeshua says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, the Spirit goes where it might, and, and we don't know. So it's not as if we can wait there and say, you know, the, the, the neon light comes in the sky to say, okay, this one. No, we've got to go test, and we've got to go find out where that, uh, the Spirit might be leading, but we'll understand pretty quickly. Uh, some of the, uh, the folks that uh, I'm witnessing to right now, I have an Israeli friend of mine, I've been sharing Yeshua with him for five plus years, and we get together for coffee all the time, and I've given him Bible and all this other stuff, and every week we, uh, we get together, we talk about scriptural things, and he's fascinated by this, and yet I've been working with him for over five years. In the modern uh, evangelism programs, that's not a very good success ratio, and we probably don't want to invest in something that doesn't really bear those kinds of results now, do we? What we're looking for is the instantaneous uh, results. We want people to come down, drop on their knees, and praise Yeshua as Lord from the first time we speak to them. It, it doesn't work that way. Another issue that we have to deal with, and some of you who know Jewish people will probably sense that Jewish people can be just a tad on the stubborn side. Okay? Um, God loves us not necessarily because we're lovable. All right? 
And so then when you think about your attitude toward Jewish people, your attitude toward Israel, we've got, we've got a lot of people within the church, the, 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 the body of Messiah today, who are condemning of Israel and who are saying, well, we need to be correcting them. It's like, well, hang on a second here. They're in unbelief. God said that he was going to bring them back in unbelief, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 36. He was going to gather them to the land, then he was going to pour his spirit upon them. And so if we're going to be condemning of Jewish practices and policies of, oh, you know, settlements uh, building in, in occupied territories and stuff like that, the job of the church is not to correct God's children because you are one of them. Because if we really want to start looking at what our attitude is, there's a whole lot of correcting that God could do in the church too, that he is gracious and merciful to us as well. Okay? Our job is to love Israel, not because they're lovable, but because God loves them. Because you were pretty unlovable too when God found you. So we, we really need to check our attitude at the, jo- the door. It's not our place to judge. Judge not lest you be judged. And we've got to be careful about how we apply that, but in this particular case, I think it's valid. However, God himself calls the Jewish people stubborn. I'm pretty convinced that Jewish people genetically have an extra vertebrae in the back of their neck. For the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles because of you. Israel's job was to be an or legoyim, a light to the nations. It was our job to tell you about Messiah. How far we have come from God's original plan of things. Not that we mess God's plan up, because we never do. But the point was is that God's original intent was to call a nation unto himself so that we could tell the rest of the world about who he was. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the real reason God chose Abraham to create a nation, is so that we could obey God's commands, God would bless us, and the rest of the world would say, well, that's the God I want to worship. That block of stone's not doing me any good over here. But we failed. And instead of glorifying God like we were supposed to, I'm going to give you a history. How many like history? Okay, I'm going to give you a history lesson right here. 4,000 years of Jewish history with God. Rebellion, um, rebellion, judgment, repentance, forgiveness. Rebellion, judgment, repentance, forgiveness. Rebellion, ju- this has been 4,000 years of Israel's history. There you have it. You don't need anything more. Have a nice day. I'm serious. If you look at Israel's history, how many times throughout the scriptures and post-scripture have you seen Israel actually in obedience to God? Very, very few times. We had King David. We couldn't even get through Solomon's reign before he went after all the idols. And that was about an 80-year stretch or so, and that was probably the longest time throughout Israel's history that they were actually uh, worshiping God. And look at the, the magnificence of Solomon's kingdom. God is just waiting to bless Israel, and they don't want to see it. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. God is going to prove himself holy through Israel, despite Israel's attitude toward him. Another problem that Israel has in recognizing their Messiah is that they don't read the scriptures. This is a picture of Menachem Schneerson, who was the, um, the, the head rabbi of the uh, Lubavitcher movement. He passed away in, I think it was 1994. He was 92 years old. And the Lubavitchers, the Chabads, um, they, Lubavitch is a town in, in eastern Russia, which this movement came out of. And essentially the Hasidic movement said that you could have a relationship with God without going through uh, the rabbis. It was heresy. Kind of like the Catholic Church today. You can actually go to God without going through the priest. Did you know that? So you don't need to go to confession anymore. Okay. We need to make stronger coffee, I think. (laughs) Um, the problem that Jewish people have in recognizing the Messiah is they're not reading the scriptures. And I just actually spoke about this last week in that um, when we look at uh, Hanukkah, and there was a whole passage in, uh, like, I, Isaiah 53, I don't know if you know this or not, this is called the forbidden chapter. They will not, many synagogues will not read Isaiah 53 as they go through the, uh, the, the prophets and the Haftorah readings. 
they'll skip right on by this chapter. Because if you read Isaiah 53, you're going to start asking a lot of questions. Now, the, uh, the, the, uh, the anti-missionaries, the rabbis, and you know, some people have come up with some very creative explanations as to what this passage actually refers to, saying that Isaiah 53 doesn't refer to the Messiah, but rather Israel. And, uh, I mean, you look at it, and you, do, you don't even have to be a Bible scholar to say, well, first of all, he suffered in silence. Well, that eliminates Israel. And uh, we can go from there. My people have done nothing ever in silence. I just want you to know that. Um, and so they will, they will not read this chapter. I actually had a conversation with a guy who was a follower of him, more for his wife than anything else, uh, many, many years ago, and over the phone, I read Isaiah 53, and he said there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that that passage is talking about Jesus. It's obvious. So, what's the solution? We don't read it. Okay? Um, Mark chapter 7, verse 6 is, Rightly Isaiah pr- did prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honors me uh, with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of man. This is what the Talmud is. How many have ever actually heard of the Talmud? Talmud is what we know as the oral law. I have a translation of it at home. It's 23 volumes. If you ever have problems sleeping, let me know. I'll lend you one. Should you get through the second page, I'll be very impressed. And so what the rabbis do is they get together and they try to decide how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Because what the Talmud is, or the oral law, the second law, is that, and they believe that this was all transcribed, it was dropped in Moses' head on Mount Sinai. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. 23 volumes, and Moses memorized it and passed it down through centuries. There are contradictions within the, script, within the Talmud. One rabbi, says, one rabbi says that, and yet they both say that they're right. It doesn't make any sense. I had a conversation, this Israeli guy that I've been sharing with, we were having a coffee at um, Bathurst um, near, near Promenade Mall, very, very Jewish area, and so we were having a, a coffee there one Friday afternoon, and we looked outside and there were a couple of young uh, yeshiva students, uh, ultra-Orthodox school, and they were out there, they were getting, you know the phylacteries, the, what we call the tefillin, the, 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 the thing on the arm and then the box on the head that the ultra-Orthodox do? It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And so they literally mean that we got to put this on our head and, and on our arms. Um, and so what they believe, the Lubavitchers believe, is that if every Jew in the world puts on the phylacteries one time, Messiah is going to come. You've got to find that passage. It may be in second hesitations, but I'm not sure. But the point is, is that this is what they believe. And they will do that. So they will stand out on the street and they will evangelize, as it were, looking for Jewish people to get them to put on these phylacteries. And so they'll, they'll troll around and they'll look for Jewish people who may look Jewish or they'll just ask, are you Jewish? And if you say, yes, I had this happen at the Wailing Wall, as a matter of fact, in, in Israel where I was going down to pray and I got ambushed by a guy who wanted me to put this stuff on. And so as we're sitting there having coffee and my friend who's not a believer is looking outside but he, he hates the hypocrisy within the ultra-Orthodox movement. They, actually, they dress a lot like that. Was that in honor of our message today that you wore? <laughs> They'll wear a black suit and... Yeah. <laughs> They'll wear, and, and so um, Lior calls them cowboys because they wear the hat and everything else. And so he says, go talk to them. And I'm looking at him as like, why are you trying to stir up trouble here? So I said to the Lord, I said, if you want this to happen, I'm pretty sure that you'll bring this about. So of course, as soon as we walk out the door of the coffee shop, he comes running across the parking lot. Hey, are you Jewish? I said, yeah. He says, well, do you want to put on the tefillin? I said, sure, we'll do it. And so as we start to do it, he says, I say to him, so what does all this mean? And so he begins to, you know, explain to me that it had something to do with someone had died and whatever and blah, blah. It was some nonsensical thing. And I said, so explain to me this. I said, Deuteronomy 27, 26 says that we have to obey all of Torah. You have to, you have to keep all 613 commandments of the law in order to be righteous. But what do we do? Well, and, and, and I said, furthermore, Leviticus 17.11 says we have to have a sacrifice. See, 
If you want to witness the Jewish people, you have to use the Torah. You've got to talk to them in their own language. You can't just go to uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16 and read that to a Jewish person. They're not going to listen to you. So I said, so what do you do? We've we got to read uh, Leviticus 17.11 says that we, we have to have a blood sacrifice. And yet, we don't have a temple. He says, well, the sages say that we can pray three times a day. And I say, well, I don't see that within the scriptures. I said, furthermore, it says that you've got to keep the whole law. And I said, um, how do you take the oral law, the Talmud, when you've got two contradictory opinions and say that it's divinely inspired and say, well, yes, it, it can seem quite confusing, but he never really answered the question. They're masters at this, by the way, I want you to know. Okay, it's like talking to a politician sometimes. <laughs> and then I asked him this one question, and this, this was beautiful. I said, so what do you do with that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that says that a uh, child is going to be born that we are going to call God? So, of course, he immediately says, well, that depends on how you interpret it. Enter my friend here who's not a believer and says, well, I'm actually pretty good in the Hebrew, and it's translated exactly the way that he says it is. And so the kid, he must have been 22, 22 years old or something like that, he stops and looks at me and says, so what you're saying is you believe the Messiah has already come. Not stupid. And I said, well, that's what it looks like to me. And, you know... I said, furthermore, Daniel tells us that the Messiah was going to come before the destruction of the temple, which happened almost 2,000 years. Well, I'm not here to argue. And the conversation pretty much ended, and he ran away from me at that point. I'm good at doing that to people. Now, as to the seed that I planted in this young man's heart, I don't know. I pray that God begins to send people his way, and he really begins to think about the things I challenged him on. But more importantly, it was for the benefit of my friend here because what the Jewish people do is that even if they aren't necessarily observant themselves, they will hold the ultra-Orthodox up to the standard by which Jews should be. This is what a Jew should look like. We don't necessarily subscribe to it, but if we're going to pick our ideal picture of a Jew, these guys are it, and I'm showing him that they can't answer questions from their own book, and yet any time this guy has ever had a question from me, I will always open the Bible and say, well, this is what the Word of God says about that. doesn't matter what it is. It could be about sex. It could be about work ethic. It could be about family. It could be about who God is. It could be about, it doesn't matter. There is an answer within the Scriptures. And so when we look at the oral law, how many have seen Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. Tradition. That's what defines us. And Yeshua says to the Pharisees, by your traditions, you nullify the commandments of God. Well, we do the same thing within the church today. And I could spend weeks talking about all the church traditions that we have that I personally believe that are infuriating to God. But that's for another day. I'm not going to have a whole bunch of emails sent to you yet. If we look at John chapter 10, verse 22, it says, at the time of the Feast of Dedication, which is what? What's the Feast of Dedication? Hanukkah. That's what Hanukkah means, dedication. So by the way, Hanukkah is mentioned one more time in the Bible than Christmas is. I'm just saying. The Jews were gathered around him, were saying to him, how long will we keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. He said, I, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name because they have come up with their own definition of what the Messiah is. The Lubavitchers, and there's still some who believe that Schneerson is going to be the Messiah. He's been dead for 20, 20 years now. They buried him with a pager. They thought he was going to rise from the dead. If he was the Messiah, I'm thinking he probably doesn't need any help. The batteries are dead, I'm sure. And he's still there. Menachem Schneerson not only was not born in Bethlehem, as was the requirement, according to Micah 5.2, he never went to Israel. But the deliverer shall come forth from Zion. We've got to stop creating God in our own image, Jew and Gentile alike. But we've taken it to a whole new level. Yeshua said, 
He, he stood and gave a great lament over Jerusalem. This was kind of like the last chance they were going to have. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets who I have sent to you. How I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers a brood under her wings, but you were not willing. And you will not see me again until the day comes when you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we're still waiting for that day. The reason that Jewish people reject Jesus is because God said it would happen. So we're fulfilling prophecy. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came unto his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Isaiah starts off chapter 53 by saying, who has believed our report and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So God knew that this was going to happen. So part of the reason why, now why would God choose this? In the greater scheme of things, we're not really too sure, but we do know that because of Jewish rejection, you all came into the faith. It was because of unbelief that the Gentiles were able to come in. Because the natural branches were cut off, you who were wild olive branches were now grafted in. Now, if we go to a bit of history, so those are the, the, the scriptural reasons, those are the spiritual reasons, but now we have a whole other set of circumstances that we now have to work against. In 70 AD, you uh, have the culmination of a five-year rebellion against Rome. The, the Jewish people were the biggest thorn in the flesh of the Roman Empire. There were three rebellions from 66 to 70, from 113 to 117, and then the biggest one, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, 132 to 135, and each and every time, the little nation of Israel almost brought down the Roman Empire. It was a war of attrition with them, and after the 132 to 35 rebellion, the Roman Empire went into decline. There was such a vast amount of resources that was needed, and that's why Jerusalem was destroyed. Hadrian kicked the Jews out, um, and they were banned from Israel for 1,800 years after that. But what happened was, is that up until 70 AD, and you need to understand this when dealing with Jewish people, is that the whole system of worship of God was based around what? The temple, the temple meaning what, what was the key component of the temple? The sacrifice. The key verse in all of Torah, and you might want to even write this down. Does anybody actually have a paper Bible anymore, or is it all electronic? <laughs> Leviticus 17.11. That is the key verse in Torah. If you want to go talk to a Jew about Jesus, you need Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar for the atonement of your souls. It is blood by reason of life that makes atonement. What is the corresponding New Covenant passage? 9.20. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. If you want to understand the book of Hebrews, you have to read Leviticus. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying to them. And that's what he says over and over. And so all these Levitical rules and laws, and a lot of people find that boring, and you've got to have this sacrifice and that sacrifice. You will not understand Hebrews properly unless you understand uh, Leviticus. So that's your key verse in Torah right there. Blood atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. 70 AD, temple's gone. Israel is now left with a choice. They either accept the messianic claims of Yeshua and believe in him as the substitution. You see, you have to understand that the sacrificial system has not been done away with, despite what Christianity would like to tell us today. You still need blood to get to heaven, don't you? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. It's just that now we have a once and for all sacrifice and that if we trust in the shed blood of Yeshua, which was done 2,000 years ago, we still are forgiven. The sacrificial system is not done away with. It's that the sacrifice that was made by the Messiah is still valid today, 2,000 years later. They either accept the messianic claims of Yeshua or they create a new religion. And this is what rabbinic Judaism became. Yochanan ben Sakai went to uh, Titus, uh, or actually Vespasian, who was, uh, no, sorry, Titus, who was about to succeed his father Vespasian as emperor. He says, we don't want any trouble. Let us go and set up our yeshiva outside of, the, uh, outside of Jerusalem. We don't want to bother anybody. And so the, the, the first rabbinic school of theology came to be right before the temple was destroyed. 
And so the Pharisees of yesteryear are the rabbis of today. It's the same theology. They were very conservative politically, but very liberal in their theology. You can make the law say anything. I mean, in the Talmud itself, there's a book on the Sabbath. There's one commandment in the Torah about the Sabbath. Other than keeping it, what is it? Do not what? Work. Now, today, there are 1,500 rules and regulations as to what defines work. There are 39 categories of work that we have defined. What you can do and what you cannot do. It'll drive you crazy trying to figure it out. And so the essence of rabbinic Judaism today is to have thousands upon thousands of commands or laws and then thousands upon thousands more ways to get around those laws. I'm not kidding you. I remember when my mom was sick with cancer and she worked for a yeshiva, an ultra-Orthodox Hebrew school, and the rabbi's wife would come over and try to explain to her, try to get my mom to be spiritual because she was the most unspiritual person you could ever imagine in your life. And he's tr she's trying to tell her how to light the candles, the, sab the Sabbath candles, which aren't even a command. It's just a tradition. But she's saying, you got to do this and this, but you, know, you can go out and you can leave these other two. And, and I'm looking at her, it's like, who tells you these things? And she says, oh, some very smart men. It was total and utter nonsense. Going back to Romans 10, rejecting the righteousness of God, they have created their own righteousness. Jewish people are very zealous for God, the one that they've created. But there's a lot of Christians who have done the same thing today too. So what happens is with the destruction of the temple, you now have the lines of demarcation. Up until that point, Messianic Judaism was simply one of many denominations. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, you had the Messianics. We were all part of the same family. We never got along with each other. Anybody who thinks that there's unity within Judaism today, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> when you get two Jews together, you'll have at least three opinions, maybe more. But what happened is, is when the, the destruction of the temple happened, all of the other denominations, all the other expressions or forms or communities of Judaism disappeared except for the Pharisees. The Sadducees were all based on the temple, so they were gone. The Zealots got wiped out in the rebellion, uh, finishing off with Masada. And what happened is, is that the unbelieving Jews became very antagonistic against the believers, partly because they didn't fight in the rebellion against Rome. You remember how Yeshua said that when, and by the way, the reason why we use the name Yeshua is because it's this Hebrew name. We want to be culturally sensitive to Jewish people when we're sharing our faith with them. We'll go into a little bit more about this, but we want to use terminology. That's, to, to, to Jewish people, the name Jesus is like nails running down a chalkboard because of what I'm going to get into in a moment. So if, um, I just want to help you ex understand that the terminology is interchangeable. We are talking about the same person. But when, um, the, the the, when Yeshua said to, in Matthew 24, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, he said, don't fight. He said, get out, because not one stone upon another will be left. And it's true, the entire temple was destroyed from top to bottom. And so the Messianics didn't fight. And the unbelieving community became very antagonistic. They began to view them as traitors. And so you have this antagonism of the unbelieving Jewish community against the, the Messianic community. But the other problem with that is that the Messianic community is now predominantly Gentile, thanks to the success of Paul. He went out, planted all these congregations out there. You now have the body of Messiah, which is predominantly Gentile. It's a numbers game. There's more of you than there are for us, so it only makes sense. But as a response to this antagonism, the, messi the, 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 the Christian community begins to pull itself away from its Hebraic roots. We don't want to deal with this antagonism anymore. We don't want to deal with this fight. So if we begin to separate Christianity from its Hebraic roots, we don't have to deal with the, the, these obnoxious Jews anymore. And so what you have is this progression of switching from Saturday to Sunday. Sunday worship never came to be until the second century. Of all, we see passages where they met on Sunday that was not the corporate day of worship. Every Christian in the first century kept the Sabbath day, bar none. 
That was the only thing they knew. It wasn't until after this happened, this destruction of the temple and the, the removal of the roots of, of the faith that we begin to move away from that. And then they stopped circumcision and then they stopped keeping the feast days. And well, if you take something out, you've got to replace it. So you begin to have the pagan holidays move into Christianity where you have Christmas and Easter. That didn't all happen until the fourth and fifth centuries. So now you've got this divide within the body. Now it's becoming more difficult to share your faith with Jewish people. And so in the synagogues, we have what's called the 18 benedictions, called the Amida. And they added a 19th one for the specific sake of the Messianics who still continue to go to the synagogues. And what they said is, may the sectarians and Nazarenes die in a moment if they do not return to you and your Torah, meaning relying on the Torah, not keeping of the commands. They, the Messianics still kept the commands of God but relying on the Torah, may they be erased from the book of life and not inscri be inscribed with the righteous. So now that this is read in the synagogue, what happens to the Messianics? Well, if I'm going to read that, what happens? You can't come anymore. You can't sit there and be under that. So now the divide is complete. This happened around 130 or 140 of the Common Era. So now the split between Christianity and Judaism is pretty much complete. There is no more working between. And so you have anti-Semitism that has now crept in through the, uh, the, the church. Because if this is what the synagogue is going to do, we're going to do the same thing. And so if you read the writings of the church fathers, guys like Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, they start to say some pretty harsh things about the Jews, and it continues to escalate where by the time you get to men in the 4th and 5th centuries like John Chrysostom and Augustine, who are revered as men of godly demeanor and whatnot, they said some of the most hateful and anti-Semitic things you could possibly imagine. Chrysostom, who was mad that his church members were running off to the synagogue to celebrate the feast days with the Jews, essentially said that the Jews were animals fit for the slaughter. You're going to win a lot of people to your way of thinking by saying those things now, aren't you? So now Jews for Judaism, an anti-Messianic organization. Did you know we have whole organizations devoted to keeping Jews away from believing in Jesus? In no other faith and no other cultural group do you have this. None. When I got saved, three years after I got saved, my uncle took me up to see the rabbi from Juda Jews for Judaism, whose job it was is to convince me I was crazy for believing in Jesus. And I sat there for three and a half hours and listened to this man talk to me about why Jesus was not the Messiah. You think that may be a little intimidating? Now the rabbi runs away from me when he sees me. But back then I was a new believer. It was a little intimidating. But I knew who I believed in. And we sat there and we went back and forth and we were debating scripture. And then three and a half hours into it as we're just about to wrap up, the rabbi turns to my uncle and he says, it's your pathetic excuse for Judaism that causes people like him to run to the other side. And I said, hallelujah, it's the first true thing he said all day. Because it's true. The hypocrisy within my people is what drove me to seek out what Judaism really meant. Little did I know. But now what they say is that the Messianics are like Nazis, spiritual Nazis. When you mention Jesus, they don't think you're going after the body. They think you're going after the soul. You don't think that's going to put a little barrier? Better believe it will. Romans 11, 11. We are commanded to provoke the Jews to jealousy. What is jealousy? Is jealousy a sin? Yeah? Jealousy is not a sin. God's a jealous God. Well, that messes a lot of things up. So what does jealousy mean? Jealousy is desiring what already belongs to you. Envy or covetousness is desiring what belongs to someone else. Paul says, do not covet your neighbor's wife, not your wife. But Pastor Mark here can certainly be jealous for his wife love if she's going out and flinging it here and there and everywhere. Or his kids. My wife runs a daycare from home. Sometimes the kids are, there are times where the kids don't want to leave. The insecure mothers really take this to heart. They're jealous for their child's love. I'm gonna, let me give you an illustration. How many of you have more than one child? Okay, how many kids do you have? 
And what's the age difference? Not quite 10 years. Okay, so they're fairly close. So you're going to get a gift for the elder one and, you know, unwraps the gift and everything else and then puts it aside, loses interest. Sits there for a couple weeks and then all of a sudden the younger one comes by and picks it up, starts playing with it. What happens? <laughs> and what does the older one say? You know, I get the same answer every time I ask that question. It's astounding. It's mine. Your job as the younger child in Christianity, the Jews are the older child, okay, the gospel's to the Jew first, is to provoke my people to jealousy. It means you have to convince, or better yet, you have to enjoy the gospel more or a relationship with the God of Israel more than we are. If you've ever been to an unbelieving Jewish Passover Seder, all it is is politics and all this other stuff that goes on. My cousin one year grabbed the BB rifle and chased his friend down the street on Passover. It was a very spiritual experience, let me tell you. <laughs> and yet when you go to a Messianic Seder, there's something beautiful that comes out of it because we're talking about the truth of God. You're not just going through the motions. And so as the Gentiles, your job is to have a better relationship with the God of Israel. And yet if you're telling Jewish people that it's okay to eat ham, celebrate Christmas, and worship on Sundays, that's not the relationship that we have with God. That's a huge impediment. Your convictions are your convictions, but when you're going to be a witness, you have to go, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. If you're going to provoke Jews to jealousy, you have to demonstrate to them that you worship the God of Israel. It's the same God. And in the mind of the Jewish people today, we think that it's all about Christi Christians. Jesus is the God of the Gentiles. That's what we think. And the church, by and large, throughout its history, has been provoking Jewish people to wrath. If we look at, um, you know, if you look at the history of anti-Semitism within the church, and I taught a whole course on this in seminary one year, Let's look now, Martin Luther, um, one of the fathers of the Reformation movement, and when he got saved, he had a very big passion, he had a great passion for the Jewish people. But when, and he figured, well, the only reason that they're not coming to faith is because, well, we haven't told them the right way. So we're going to preach Messiah through the Torah. Good job. Except that it didn't quite happen on his schedule. And so if you look, 20 years later, he wrote a, a, a book called The Jews and Their Lies. Now, there was a suggestion that Martin Luther might have been bipolar. There was a lot of really uh, you know, emotional stuff. But here's what he said in his treatise. Number one, we should burn the synagogues and schools. Number two, we destroy their houses. Number three, we confiscate their, the, the Talmud and the prayer books. Number four, we forbid the rabbis from teaching. Number five, safety of travel is removed. Number six, money is confiscated. Number two, forced labor. Number eight, expel them from the land. Does this look vaguely familiar? Who adopted this program? Yeah, he just added number nine. We're going to kill them all. Hitler didn't come up with anything original. He already had the blueprint right out for him. Now, how do you expect my people are going to respond favorably to the message of love when that's what it looks like? When you preach Jesus to Jewish people, this is what they think of. When we have a cross out there, you know what the cross represents to Jewish people? Persecution. Persecution. The Crusades, the Red Cross. That usually meant burning in the synagogues and death unless you were baptized. The Spanish Inquisition, be baptized or die. The pogroms in Eastern Europe, you Christ killers. And Hitler, who had the support of the Catholic Church, at least tactically, because Pius really didn't say a whole lot. This is what Jewish people think when you talk about Jesus. That's a lot to overcome. I was standing out, and I know I'm going a little bit longer here, but I really want to emphasize this. I was standing out in the streets of New York City three months before 9-11, street evangelism. If you want to stretch your boundaries, go out like a billboard saying that Jesus is the Messiah with shirt, t-shirt, you know, cap, um, uh, knapsack, and everything else, and stand on the street of an ultra-Orthodox uh, neighborhood and see what kind of response you get. So I hand a tract to this one woman, and she walks away 
goes probably about 50, 60 feet, looks down and says, oh, Lord, here it comes. She looks up and she says, you idiot! And starts storming toward me and yelling at me and blah, 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 and cursing at me and everything else. And she says, you know, something about Hitler. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I'm talking about the Jewish Messiah according to the Hebrew Scriptures. What's this got to do with Hitler? But that's the association they make in their minds because Hitler was a Catholic. We don't know the difference between uh, uh, evangelical or Protestant and Catholic. We know nothing about that. All we know is this is what has been done to us in the name of Jesus. You have to know this going in. There are all kinds of associations that we make. And now what we have is this whole theology within the church today called replacement theology. It means the church has replaced Israel as God's covenant people and his promises. Well, you can't read the scriptures honestly. I mean, 11, Romans 11, chapter uh, 20, verses, uh, 20 and 21. Do not be conceited by fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Have they stumbled that they should fall? May it never be. God has not forsaken his people. But yet the church is saying this today. And we have whole denominations which are all millennial or post-millennial, which says that, you know, the promises that God made to Israel are not valid anymore because they rejected Jesus. Well, when did God's promises ever depend on what we did? Is there any condition with the new covenant? No, I will write my law upon your hearts and your minds. He's going to do it regardless of what we do. So if God is going to not keep his promises to Israel... What makes you think he's going to keep his promises to you? What assurance do you have unless God is faithful even when we're faithless? No, the, con- the promises that God made to Abraham about the land are unconditional. And Israel has never been in possession of the land that God promised them through the Torah. Therefore, it still has to come. We came close under Solomon's reign, but it's never been. So replacement theology, not valid. And it's a heresy as a matter of fact. And then we look at the expressions of Christianity today. They're not really all that Jewish, are they? Jewish people are not going to come into a, a house with all this or a church or something like that with all, this, all these decorations and recognize that you worship the God of Israel. Now, whether you choose to celebrate these things, that's between you and God. It's not for me to tell you what to do. But all I'm saying is if you want to be an effective witness to Jewish people, these are things we have to consider. We gotta go back to the original. You're not going to win a Jewish person to faith by having Easter egg hunts. I personally don't think that we're really honoring to God doing these things since we, if we look at the source and they're all pagan anyway. I mean, honestly, what does a, a, an egg laying rabbit have to do with the Jewish Messiah and the Passover? I, I'm still trying to figure this one out. See, God has already told us how he wants to be honored. And it's through the Passover. That's what we do with the Lord's table. But when we do a whole Passover Seder and then we invite unbelieving Jewish people and we present that Messiah is the fulfillment of these things, then it makes a whole lot of sense. And as a matter of fact, I did one more um, a message that day. It was 2007, not six. And I had done one in the morning, did Rosewood in the afternoon, and then I went to Doxa in the evening. And uh, the third Passover presentation, I mean, I was running on fumes that day. We had eight kids give their life to the Lord when I presented the gospel through the Passover. There is no more effective means of evangelism than God's feast days, bar none. Because the gospel message is interwoven through all of his appointed times. Quickly here. So how do we share? Well, we have to, first of all, know what the objections are, and then we have to be able to answer them scripturally. Michael Brown has a wonderful series called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. There are five volumes. My people object to a lot of things. Okay? Bottom line is that if we are going to win Jewish people over, we have to demonstrate to them that we worship the same God. How it comes out in your own faith and your own walk, who knows? But I believe that when we start doing things the way God suggested that they be done, and has asked, he was commanded us to do these things. 
And we don't have a separate set of rules in the Bible for Jews and Gentiles. That, I don't know where that came. Do you have a separate set of rules for your kids? No. God doesn't either. And I could show you half a dozen passages in the Bible that says I have the same law for the alien and the, na- the native, for the Jew and the Gentile. So if God says that the Passover is his appointed time, then we all would be blessed, I guess, if we were to observe that. Well, you have appointed times, don't you? What happens if he misses? (sighs) There's a look of fear on his face right now. (laughs) We all have times that are important to us, do we not? And we ask that our, the people that we love honor those appointed times, whether it be anniversaries, birthdays, whatever. doesn't matter. Well, God had his, has his appointed times. He did something wonderful for us in those appointed times. He bought a salvation at Passover. The resurrection happened on the Feast of First Fruits. He gave us the Spirit on Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. God wants to tell you about the wonderful things that he has done for you on his special days. So you know what? Show up it's probably going to be a blessing there. Amen? We, we got to stop looking at God's timetable and stuff like that as being something that's burdensome. It's a blessing. And in the process, when we begin to demonstrate to Jewish people that we worship the same God as they do, they're going to be drawn. How do you provoke a Jew to jealousy? When you go to a Messianic Passover Seder and you tell them about a wonderful time that you had and all these insights that you got, We don't have people chasing our friends down the street with rifles. Not many that I've done anyway. (laughs) And if we do, then there's something seriously wrong. But the point is, is that a Jewish person will be provoked to jealousy if you, who having no, I love it when when, um, uh, uh, people from the islands, like Jamaicans, they celebrate the Passover, then they go tell their Jewish friends. And they look at them and go, why? Because I worship the God of Israel and I love the Jewish people. Door just flew wide open. Now you get a, a dialogue that's going. God's heart is for his people. And God has chosen me to bear this burden. He said the night that I got saved 17 years ago, March 29, 1998, 11 o'clock at night, I was sitting in my bedroom. I said the sinner's prayer. I had finally given up fighting. Don't fight against God. It doesn't work. All you do is get hurt. And the very first thing he said to me was that you had such a hard time reconciling me and your Jewish identity. Now you're going back to your people. I can assure you I did not jump off my bed and say hallelujah. There is no ministry I think that is more fraught with frustration and discouragement and crazy things happening spiritually and yet there's no ministry that can provide greater satisfaction than seeing one Jewish person finally forsaking all of these things and recognizing that Yeshua of of Nazareth is the Messiah of Israel. And I invite you to partner up with us to make that happen. Amen? Let's pray. Avinu Shema Shemayim, our Father art in heaven. In the blessed name of our Messiah Yeshua, we thank you that your word is true and every word of God is tested. We thank you that we have the assurance of knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And even your covenant people, your chosen people who have been so rebellious and who have hurt you so much over the centuries, that unless the heavens above can be measured and the earth below searched out, only then will you cast them off for all that they have done. And we long for the day, Father, when all of Israel will recognize their Messiah, and they shall mourn as one mourns for an only son, and grieve as one grieves for a firstborn. So Father, we ask your blessing upon the nation of Israel, we ask your protection upon them, and through the sharing of our faith with Jewish people, I know, Father, that we're just going to be more effective in sharing our faith with any, everybody, because the gospel came to the Jew first, and then through them to the rest of the nations, and so the model, Father, has always been through Israel. And yet, you even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that they were an example to us upon whom the ends of the ages have been written. So Father, let us take these things to heart. Let us have a burden for the salvation of the Jewish people and to be praying for them. Shalom shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But also, Father, may we draw closer to you 
in our efforts to reach every tongue, tribe, and nation with the gospel. Because you have said that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Let the nations not be excluded from this prayer, Father, but rather included, that we may truly create a movement of Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah, one new man. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.